California Association and Healthcare Leaders and San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders Board of Governors exam preparation session. So we're just letting uh, our participants in and um, appreciate having you again here today. As a reminder, we will have you on, um, on mute, but uh, we'll be using the chat room as much as possible to make this interactive. We'll also ask you for uh, your um, uh, patience as we uh, work with our different teams, but uh, also put things in the chat room, questions, uh, things you'd like us to see uh, presented, or um, if we do have a question that comes up and we don't have the answer right away for you today, we have our parking lot and we'll get back to you with that. Um, so again, welcome. As more folks are joining us, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Okay, um, it sounds like we have a very uh, uh, good, we have 26 folks in our room here. So does it sound like we could get started? I believe so. We're good, all right. So go ahead, Nora. Well, hello, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us again on a Saturday morning. Uh, for our second uh, session of our webinar series. Um, today we're covering healthcare technology and in information management. There are, so far on the test currently, there's 18 questions related to this knowledge area, which is 9% of the exam, and human resources, which has 22 questions and 11% of the examination. And again, this is in conjunction with the uh, Cal up north and Seoul, San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders down south. And this is so exciting to do, be doing this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, to reintroduce ourselves just really quick, because we like doing this. Um, so this is the uh, advancement committee members. You should have our contact information at least, well, actually you only have mine and Sherry's. We'll be putting the rest, everyone else's contact information in case you have any specific questions. And you can find us in the member directory as well. But um, so this is this is uh, Cal members and next slide, please. And here are the members of the San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders and at this time, I'd like to introduce Nick, who can uh, introduce himself and speak a little bit to the to the military members among our uh, participate participants today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicholas Hans, um, uh, co-chair for the uh, BOG Advancement Study Group for Seoul, and uh, just being active duty Navy, I'm stationed at uh, MCAS Miramar here in San Diego. Uh, it's per Sherry's request that uh, we do a uh, just a quick shout out to all of our uh, military personnel, and uh, we thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Nick. And uh, later he'll be introducing Angela Rivera, who's our guest speaker presenter for today. Uh, next slide. Okay, a couple of updates and frequently asked questions, FAQs. Um, for those of us that are participating in the Congress coming up the, Mar the week of March 22nd, there are going to be three opportunities to 
uh, participate in a fellow advancement information session. So um, they'll be on March 22nd. All of these are in, in Pacific uh, daylight time now that we're switching tomorrow. So on the 22nd, 23rd and 24th, which is Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. So in, if you wanna get in on those, I think that'll be very useful. Um, email communications. I again will be sending out, I'm, with technical difficulties, I have not sent out the follow-up materials for session one yet. At least I got out the materials for session two ahead of time. So you'll be receiving shortly the session one follow-up as well as the section, the session two follow-up, preferably in different emails because there's a lot of, um, a lot of material. And so I apologize if I'm blowing up your inboxes with that. And then midweek-ish, I should be sending out the materials for session three. So what we're hoping is that you get those in enough time to be able to at least understand the highlighted the highlights of the knowledge areas, and you get to listen to uh, Rick's pre-recorded presentation. So, because what we're going to concentrate on today, just a really high-level review of the of the highlights, and then concentrate on some of the sample questions, and then the follow-up materials will be to include the PowerPoint presentation plus the recording for today. Um, an older PowerPoint, but with the recording of today's session. And um, a reminder, we will be sending a survey monkey out at the end of the series. So if you wanna take notes about what went right, what didn't, what you liked, what you didn't um, about each session. And we do listen. Um, we, we've listened to the first, the results from our sur first survey <laughs> monkey. So please be brutally honest. Um, next slide, please. I'll go ahead at this moment um, before I talk about the test taking tips to introduce a very special guest for us today. Uh, Jennifer Paoli uh, is with us and Jennifer um, is a recent um, promoted fellow in the American College of Healthcare Execs. Uh, Jennifer joins us uh, and she is the Director of Business Operations and Patient Care Services at UC Davis Medical Center. And we are so happy to have her because Jennifer is your connection and your ability to ask about the exam, the most one of the most recent uh, exam test takers and give her insights and pearls of wisdom. So welcome. Thank you so much, Sherry. I'm uh, glad to be here, excited to share any pearls of wisdom that I can with the group. Um, uh, as Sherry said, so I work at UC Davis Medical Center. I've been there for um, just over 20 years, the Director of Business Operations and Patient Care Services. Um, I work directly with a lot of people that are connected to Cal. Uh, Toby Marsh is our Chief Nursing Officer and he was the president of, uh, for Cal back in 2018, I believe. Uh, Kimberly Blechner Jones, who's the current Cal Treasurer, um, Jolene Lonigan, who's the co-chair of the mm -hmm. Clinical Leadership Committee, and there's a couple of executive directors I see here on this call, Judy Beamer and Carla Martin, that I work with on a daily basis as well. So glad to be in good company with all of you all. Um, so I just, I took the Board of Governors uh, course prep that you guys are all taking right now back in the fall, and it was so helpful for me because I really had no idea what to really expect. Um, I joined ACHE just over three years ago. And so I had kind of procrastinated uh, at getting prepared for taking the Board of Governors exam and waited until almost it was up to my three years before I really started doing my prep work for it. And back then you had to wait three years before you could even sit for the test. So I know they've changed that now to where you only have to be a member for a year. So I waited right up until my deadline before I even started prepping for it. I really found that the course materials um, provided, or the study materials provided with the Board of Governors exam review course were so helpful for me for um, preparing for the test. I also ordered the study materials that were offered um, through ACHE. I ordered the books and the flashcards. I found the flashcards were very helpful for me. Um, I'm kind of a hard copy paper person. 
So I liked having the hard copy flashcards. I would sit on my couch at night and sort them, go through them. If I knew them, I put them in one pile. And if I didn't, I put them in another pile. And then I kept going and yep, that box that Nora's got right there. And I kept going through them until that uh, stack of ones I didn't know got very small. Um, I also used the Quizlet app that you get the link to when you buy the flashcards. Mm -hmm. I was using the, um, the app really like when I was walking in and out from work, from the parking garage to my office, um, when I was brushing my teeth in the morning, sorting through the flashcards, anything I could do to just make sure that I was staying on top of those. So those were really helpful. This, I have to say though, the materials that um, Nora will be sending out to you um, after you take the each class each Saturday, that was really what helped me the most for studying. Um, I, I found that I'm, as I said, I'm a paper person. Judy and Carla can tell you, they've seen my office. It's got a lot of papers everywhere. I printed out everything not very uh, green, I guess you could say. I have a three inch thick binder that I printed everything and have it all in so I could go through and reread and highlight and make notes for myself. That was, that's the way I study the best. And so that was, I think the most helpful for me. So when I finished all of my face-to-face -face credits, that was what I really um, was struggling with was getting all my face-to-face -face credits before I could submit my application because Everything shut down in 2020, so I was very thankful that ACHE started offering virtual face-to-face -face classes so I could get those face-to-face -face credits in. So when I finally finished those and I was able to submit my application in January, I was thinking, okay, I give myself about six to eight weeks before I take this test so I could have a nice good plan for studying. And because of all the limits that Pearson View is doing with their testing centers with only allowing so many people in at a time, most testing centers weren't scheduling tests until June or July. And I thought, well, that gives me a lot of time to study, but really not ideal for me because I knew that I would just push it off until it got closer. I wouldn't really set myself up to just kind of focus on my studying. So I was kept searching and I found a test center that was about an hour drive away from my house that I was able to get a test for three weeks out. A little bit shorter prep time than I was hoping for, but I went ahead and thought, okay, let's do this. I, so I scheduled myself for the test three weeks out. I was very nervous. Um, I didn't tell a whole lot of people at work about it because I thought I don't want to jinx myself and uh, just in case I didn't pass. So I think um, I told Kimmy and uh, Toby's assistant who works for me, I didn't tell a whole lot of people. In those weeks leading up to my exam, I spent a lot of very focused time doing my studying. Every night I would spend time just focused on one section of what was gone over in this exam um, prep course. Go through my binder, I was highlighting, I was went back to my college days and I was taking book notes and that's the way that I study the best is so that I can kind of regurgitate all that information in my head over and over again. The more I write it, the more it sticks. Um, on the weekends, I would lock myself in my bedroom away from my husband and my kids so I could have some peace and quiet and study for probably a good three to four hours every weekend. The day before my exam, I just spent time only about an hour or so rereading all those book notes that I took because those were the things I was I found that I didn't feel as comfortable about those were the things that I was taking book notes on. So I, I really spent a lot of time just rereading those so that I felt more comfortable with that information. I ate a really good dinner. I tried to go to bed early. I didn't sleep well because I was nervous. Um, got up early because I had to drive an hour away to go and take the test. And I'm not a morning person that eats breakfast as soon as I get up, but I knew I needed to eat something so I wouldn't... Uh, crashed halfway through the exam. So I forced myself to eat some good protein while I was driving to my exam. The people at the Pearson View Testing Center were super helpful and friendly. They know that everybody coming in there is uh, taking a big exam and is probably a little bit nervous. They were so nice. Walked you through all of their extra procedures that you have to go through now with the uh, hand sanitizing and making sure you've got your mask and staying away from people. It was, it was um, 
a little intimidating. I've never been to a proctored test testing center before, so it was a little bit intimidating, but they were so, so helpful. Um, at each testing spot in the room, there was in the center I was at, there was room for 15 people total that could be there. And there was only four of us there that morning. So we were very spaced out. They had uh, noise canceling headphones available for you at each testing spot. But it was because there were so few people in there, it wasn't really necessary for me. Everybody was just clicking away, clicking their answers away. While I was taking the exam, I just kept repeating to myself in my head the things that were stressed to us that are on this slide that you see right here, the exam um, test taking tips. Breathing, slow down, take your time, read each question so thoroughly. And what I really found the most helpful was if it was a question I really wasn't sure of or there was multiple answers that seemed like they could be right, I would read each question with one answer and think of it as a true or false statement. And that was the most helpful for me to go through and determine, yeah, these both could be right, but this one's more right. So that was, that was really helpful for me. Um, I did take one break during the exam, just a little bio break, came back. Um, they give you six hours to take the exam. I finished in just under three. While I was taking it, I kept second guessing myself on a couple of questions. And so it's very nice that they allow you to go back and mark a question to review. So I did that for probably about 20 questions. So at the end, I went back and read, read through those questions. And I ended up keeping my answer the same as what my initial gut put on them. Um, chances are your first gut reaction is right. And I think that worked out in my favor. Um, at the very end of the exam, there's about a 10 question survey that um, they ask you if you wanna complete. So I did that. And as soon as I hit submit on that uh, last question of the survey, it said, congratulations, you passed. And I just took a huge deep breath and sigh of relief. And I was so thankful that I was done. And then they give you your printout right away that shows how you did on each section. I was uh, very relieved to be done with it. I went out to my car and took a really cute picture of me holding my exam, and sent it to a couple of people at work. And um, there was actually a big, big management meeting going on at that time when I happened to send it and said, Toby put my picture up on the screen and I didn't know about that. And uh, all of a sudden started getting a whole bunch of text messages and uh, emails from all of my colleagues giving me a big congratulations. So it was very exciting. I'm so thankful for the support that I had from all my leaders at UC Davis and these amazing tools that were provided by Cal for this um, Board of Governors exam test prep. It was so helpful. I think that it was really what led to me being successful. And, um, I'm just very thankful for this and so I was glad to come and share my knowledge and uh, information and I'm glad to answer any questions. I'll put my um, con um, LinkedIn information in the chat. If anybody wants to connect, I'll put my email in there too. Please feel free to reach out. I am glad to answer any questions. So Jen, really quick, I like the idea of you taking a picture of yourself with, with your test results. Please send that to us. I want to put it on a slide. Um, those, the rest of you between now and, you know, once you pass your exam, send us the pictures. We want to celebrate your success. Um, the second question I have for you is the sample questions we're using, we acknowledge are at least from 2018. Did you see similar, do you recall seeing similar questions so that when you saw those questions, you remembered seeing them in our in our presentation. In other yes. words, are they valid? Yes, valid no, studies. Absolutely, they were very familiar. Um, some of them, as soon as they popped up, it's like, oh, I know this. I've been studying this, so it was. Uh, they were okay, very relevant. Very relevant still. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We are um, now deputizing you as a member of the Advancement Committee. <laughs> and your presentation is fantastic. Uh, you'd be a, a, it would be just a valuable 
uh, experience to have you presented every session, but we have this yeah. recorded too. So, and we're taking notes, but thank you. A couple questions um, we had in the chat room is, did you get your results right away? I think you. Yes. Yes, as soon as soon as I hit submit and um, I turned around and the proctor waved me over and told me congratulations and gave me my printout. It was fantastic. Do you recall, was there any surprises that you did better in one topic area or maybe not uh, as well? Just uh, curi curious in terms of your, um, do they, they still break it out by, by domains, right? By topics? Yes, yeah, the results are still broken out by topics. I'm kind of almost ashamed to admit, being that I'm the director of business operations, that I scored lower in finance than I thought I would. <laughs> it's, but, it's interesting. Yeah, I think some of the areas we overprocess in, uh, and that was my experience as well. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was really interesting. It's like, but I know this. I know my job, and, and maybe it's because I didn't focus so much on that section because you know I thought oh, I know all of this. So that that could yeah. be why. So don't don't assume you know everything. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, we do appreciate it. Putting our contact in the chat room would be great. And. Uh, uh, if there's any more questions uh, or you have questions you can think about later, I'll get them to, to Jen and uh, get them back to you. So thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. I, I don't even want to say anything more about what you did. I'll just uh, say the breathing uh, technique I have here uh, on the slide is about just focus on the area around your heart and imagine your breathing's coming in and out of your heart. And uh, that is one uh, option for you, uh, as you mentioned, in between uh, or to prep or reset during the test. So that's it for this uh, section. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Okay. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay. Nick, it's your turn. Hello again, everyone. Um, it is. Uh, with great pleasure on behalf of Seoul, we're very happy to introduce our uh, subject matter expert for the IP portion of our program. Her name is Angela Rivera. She is a passionate executive with more than 25 years of experience with significant focus serving the healthcare provider industry. Ms. Rivera is a fellow of Health Information Management Systems Society and former president of the SoCal chapter. Ms. Rivera currently serves as a member of the Board of Advisors Health sector lead for Cyventar, a transformative cybersecurity company offering cybersecurity as a service with measurable outcomes. Ms. Rivera also served as executive VP of operations for Synergistic, a best in class ALAS, her focused cybersecurity, privacy, and compliance consulting firm. Prior to Synergistic, Ms. Rivera served 17 years at Computer Task Group. International IT Solutions and Services Company, where she led healthcare solutions for physician practice organizations, community hospitals, and integrated delivery networks. Ms. Rivera serves as an advocate for the advancement of women in technology and currently serves on the board of directors for Women in Healthcare Information Technology, HIT, and was named, um, I thought this was big, Women in Healthcare IT to Know. Hospital Review in both 2018 and Mr. Vera has lived in San Diego her whole life where she enjoys spending time with her husband and two adult children. And she also serves as a guardian, scholar, mentor, supporting foster youth education and career aspirations. So very impressive resume. With that being said, I will turn it over to Miss Angela. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here. Um, and I'm going to just give a little plug for Women in Health IT, and we hold um, educational events all the time for professional growth, networking, so any women that would like to be reached out to join some of the events we're doing, I would be happy to add you to that list. You can just put it in the chat because it is a passion of mine. Okay. Um, we can move on to the next slide. What we'll do is just review quickly kind of the foundational topics that you're going to need to know with healthcare technology and information management. I was thinking this might be Jen's least favorite topic because she said she's a paper person. 
And as you know, with information technology, we try to move away from paper as much as possible. So, um, and then after I review just these high level topics of areas that you'll need to fo focus your studies on, we will review um, some sample questions. And we have somebody, a rich Rick on the line who will help us kind of walk through the questions, but also give some tips and tricks of how to narrow your answers, selection of your answers. So to kick it off, um, one of the main areas you're going to need to focus on is the knowledge of the role and function of information technology in business operations. And like I said, with the advancements in technology and its impact in almost everything we do, IT really should be considered a business partner to help business operations meet, meet is, its objectives. So you'll probably see a lot of questions about what IT does, and that's really its primary goal. Um, second area is knowledge of technology trends and clinical applications in the healthcare organization. You know, requiring a high level understanding of how technology is used across the healthcare system will be important for you to understand. Uh, third, knowledge of technology policies and regulations, such as complying with HIPAA security requirements, complying with High Tech Act meaningful use requirements for electronic healthcare records. Um, you know, the main focus really is on protecting patient data and the exchange of data between facilities or with, you know, between providers. The fourth is the knowledge of health informatics needed for operational decisions, you know, such as data and equipment interoperability standards. You know, with the focus on improving healthcare outcomes, you know, understanding how DAPS how data is captured, managed, analyzed, and interpreted to identify, you know, best ways to deliver high quality care is really important. And this kind of healthcare informatics focuses on that. Next slide. Uh, the fifth area is knowledge of potential impacts and consequences of healthcare IT decision-making on staff and processes across the board. So in finance, operations, healthcare, and quality of care. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ultimate goal of IT is to support the strategy um, of the business op objectives. So it's important that, you know, they work across the organization. It's important for you to understand how they interact with everybody. And then knowledge of information systems continuity. So disaster planning, recovery, backup, security, sabotage, and even natural disasters. Um, and many of you who hold leadership positions are gonna be asked to sit on um, committees or be part of an incident response team. So it's really important for you to understand and have um, knowledge of these areas. Uh, knowledge of factors that influence selection, acquisition, and maintenance of IT systems, whether it's, you know, initial purchase, upgrades and conversions, you know, understanding the whole technology life cycle. Um, again, remember that the goal of technology is to ensure that the business objectives are being met. So as you go through selecting products, as you go through your upgrades and conversions, um, you know, you're making decisions about how to best impact those objectives with the use of technology. And then last is the knowledge of healthcare analytics. And we know healthcare analytics is a big topic right now. Um, you know, it's very relevant and it gives trending data to make good decisions for, you know, the future operations of your um, departments and also patient care. So with that, um, those are the high level objectives and what you're going to be covering um, in your study and on your test. But we'd like to go through some sample questions and see how everybody does, how they're doing with their test um, studying and help maybe walk them through some of the questions and how to best answer them. Next slide. And um, 
Nora and Rick, please advise here. Are we asking people to put their answers in the chat for this or just to hold their answers and then we'll show them the answer after? Oh, by all means, start chatting away. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, how people are responding as we go, because if we find that a lot of people might be answering the wrong question, answer, we'll be able to kind of talk through why that might be the best choice. Okay. Ah, we see answers coming through already. This is great. So the first question is, why is it important for IT strategy to align with the organization's goals and objectives? Um, we see some questions. Bs in the chat room and a D. I'm sorry, all Bs, apologize. All Bs. I think everybody on this group knows that aligning with goals and objectives, as I mentioned earlier, is the primary purpose of IT. Rick, do you want to add any comments to that? Well, the only thing I want to comment on this one is when I'm going through and thinking true, false, they're really all true. There, there's nothing on here that I'm thinking is totally wrong. So what I have to look for is the one that's the broadest and B is definitely more broad than anything else. And again, I think, you know, remembering that IT is there to meet goals and objectives, you know, remembering that will help you answer that question too. Okay. You all got it right. Congratulations. The second question, what competencies do not matter in selecting a CIO? Again, Jen mentioned this, read the question thoroughly. I am a very fast reader. So I might tend to go, what competencies do matter, right? Because I miss the do not, right? So just read it carefully. And I think everybody's answering so far correctly. And to me, this one is, is much more obvious which one's wrong. So. Again, doing a true false prior manager experience for CIO, yeah, obviously. Knowledge of the organization, yeah, got to have that. Um, D, budget skills, if you're going to be the CIO, you need to at least be able to budget your own department. So C is the only one that is not true, and therefore it's, it's going to be the one that I would pick for a not matter. And some people might say you can influence better if you have a relationship with the board. <laughs> Kind of true, but really, if you can master A, C, and D, you're going to have good influence regardless of a relationship. And another key to that previous question, so concentrate on the word not. Remember, read each word, otherwise you may miss the not. Another way it may be stru structured is all of these are important, except, you know, and those are the words that clue you in to to what the least, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've guilty of passing over not many times. So again, re read each word. Jen had indicated that as well. Yeah, and Mark Campbell makes a really good point, which is we're looking for the best answer. Even if something is right, it doesn't mean it's the best one. So usually it's going to be the one that's the most broad uh, answer will be the right one. Okay, next question. One of the major elements of strategic IT plan is A, requests for proposals from vendors, B, a list of detailed specifications for computer programs, C, priorities for individual computer applications to be aligned with the strategic objectives of the organization, or D, specification for computer hardware installation and maintenance. Maybe I can walk through this one because uh, I've never even seen a strategic IT plan. I'm not sure what one looks like. So I don't have this obvious, but I can look at it and say, okay, request for proposals. No, that's gonna flow from the IT plan. So that's wrong. Detailed specs, anytime I see detailed and strategic, that should be a red flag. Um, priorities for individual computer applications being aligned. Ooh, the word align there is jumping off the page to me. So strategic, and aligning objectives, that, that's a, a good one. 
And then specifications. No, that's the same as the as B. So D and B are too specific for me. So process of elimination, even without knowing what this is, C is going to be my answer. And the other trick there is just again, IT's responsibility is to align with strategic objectives of the organization, right? So there's always that default. If you're really confused, if you see alignment with strategic or business objectives, and you want to, if you get to a point where you just have to guess, that is a good guess. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, number four, the element most critical to the successful design and implementation of an executive decision support system in a healthcare organization is A, availability of software for updating the database, B, maintaining data confidentiality, C, involvement of top management, or D, availability of network computer equipment. So I'm looking at this and since it's most critical, I'm gonna just assume that they're all critical and I'm looking for the most. Um, the other word that's jumping out of me, that we're focusing on executive decision-making. So it's not, thing, it's not generally all IT, but it's specifically this one. And that's why I would go with C. Again, they're all important, but C is gonna be the most important as, we lead, as we're looking at executive decision support. Yeah, and so here again, my, my advice here is to read every word carefully, the design and implementation of an executive decision support system. You have to have involvement of top management if it's gonna impact them. And remember, it's impacting their business objectives as executives. So that was a hard one because maintaining data confidentiality is critical but it's not the most critical, critical to the success of the design and implementation. That confidentiality can be handled in other ways. Okay, next. The goal of HIPAA in terms of security and privacy was to A, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the healthcare system via electronic data interchange, B, expand the privacy and security requirements of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, C, provide financial incentives for implementing secure electronic records, or D, establish privacy standards for federal government organizations only. And this one, two answers look right, but so I'm curious yeah, this one's, if anybody answers it. This one's a tough one because improve the efficiency and effectiveness of electronic data exchanges. So I'm thinking HIPAA came in in 1997. When did we start doing data exchanges? So I'm gonna hold on that one. Expand privacy of the ARA. No, ARA came in uh, 2008. Provide financial incentives. Nope, that's ARA again. So that's no. Um, establish privacy standards for federal government only. We wish it was, that's everyone. So. I'm not totally comfortable with A, but I can eliminate the other three and therefore A has to be my answer. So here's how I also look at it. Remember, read the question carefully. The goal, right? What was the goal? Usually your goals are to improve, right? So I look at, okay, the goal is to improve. And remember earlier when I was saying what topics, privacy of patient data and managing data exchange is really critical. So that all comes in with A. On B, you usually don't have goals to expand acts, right? So, you know, if you're having a hard time figuring those two out, I think really just go back to what a goal really should do. And it looks like most people got it right, but there were a few that did pick B. Um, and just that's where I would go back to what is really a goal there to achieve? Is it to achieve, is it to, the goal is to expand and act. Usually the goal addresses something of improvement. Okay. All right, number six, proprietary medical information is protected within an organization 
on what type of server? Internet, intranet, extranet, or secure net? Looks like lots of bees. One of the nice things they do in writing questions is come up with a word that doesn't really exist, but it sounds like it should. So <laughs> secure net is something, man, I want a secure net. That's where I'm putting my proprietary stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I've never heard of a secure net, so I, I wish it was there, but not. Uh, extra net doesn't even sound good, let alone not he hearing about it. We're sure not putting everything on the internet. And again, process of elimination. We've, we've got a false, true, false, false. I'm gonna go with B as the true one. Yep. And that is the correct answer. I know somebody in answered A. Internet is for everybody. Um, extranet is an actual IT term. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, but what extranet means is it partially allows external people to enter your intranet. Like if you're outsourcing services to a vendor who can integrate with your tools. So here again, it's within an organization. So you have to read every question carefully. And secure net was in Terminator, we're told. <laughs> yeah. And that is you not are. okay. okay. Not real. <laughs> you need to keep us on our toes, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Seven, knowledge management is defined as A, the practice of explicitly and deliberately building, reviewing, and applying relevant intellectual assets to maximize organizational effectiveness. B, the transfer of structured information between two computer systems. C, a movement to explicitly use the current best available scientific evidence for managerial decision-making. D, the planning, organization, organizing, directing, and controlling of resources to accomplish goals and objectives related to a distinct initiative. So these, there are a lot of words and you have to read them pretty carefully. There are a lot of words in this one. And someone said that the one with the longest uh, sentence is probably the right one. I don't know that I would believe that, but certainly one, if I break it down, you know, what is knowledge management? Well, it's intellectual assets. You know, it's Mac, the goal is to maximize unit, uh, organizational effectiveness. So that one's looking kind of good to me. Uh, transferring information doesn't promote knowledge. Uh, using best scientific e evidence, well, yeah, okay, that's something we're trying to do, but uh, knowledge management and evidence-based are not the same thing. And the last one looks like something that someone put would put in to make it sound really good that has no meaning, right? So, you know, related to a distinct initiative, yeah, right, what, what? It doesn't tell me anything. So I'm going to go back to A. And Rick's right about trying to be global. So two things here, it, you know, knowledge management is for the whole organization. So D can be eliminated because it says it's related to a distinct initiative, right? Um, and again, back to tools are there to help support organizational strategy goals, objectives. And so to maximize organizational effectiveness is doing that. This is Michael. Uh, can I have a commentary in terms of knowledge base for these uh, uh, selections? Because uh, for the B, uh, uh, knowledge on electronic data interchange, this is a definition of electronic data interchange. And the C is a definition of evidence-based management. And the D is a definition of a project management. So the, the writer for this just defined all those terms and put on the in there. So if you, as a test taker, uh, the, you, know, you, you should also know the basic knowledge of those terms. That's correct. Take those notes, everybody. <laughs> B, C, and D have their own, our own description for something else you might be tested on. Yeah, and that's one of those scary things that every once in a while you'll get an answer say, wait a minute, didn't I read that somewhere else and it was wrong? And it was wrong then, but it's right now. Good point. Yeah. All right, next question. 
Which of the following is the reason that the system support outcomes data and analysis can be very complex? A, the required data typically provide systems and enablement. Someone needs to get on mute, please. We hear a lot of background. Angela, you might have to repeat that um, with our background noise. Thanks. Sure. The question was, which of the following is the reason that system support and outcomes data collection and analysis can be very complex? A was the required data typically resides in multiple information systems and in manual systems. B, the functional departments are not integrated with financial information systems. There is medical terminology across different clinical systems. Or D, open system interface engines and So when I look at this one, um, and I'm gonna show my lack of knowledge in this area, but um, certainly I know that healthcare organizations are incredibly complex and we get siloed in all sorts of different ways. So A is sounding pretty good to me. Um, B, first of all, I hope not, right? But second, does that really have anything to do with the, the outcomes data and collection? Not really. No, financial is not really a clinical outcome, so I'm gonna ignore that. Uh, inconsistent medical terminology, God, I hope not. Um, I would think that we'd figure out a way to, to bridge those for our analysis. So then D, now this is where I don't know what those are. I really have absolutely no idea. I can think multimedia data entry, I could probably figure out, but I don't know the rest of it. So. I could be fooled on this because it's saying system support. Maybe it's talking hardware, but I don't think so. And that's why I'm gonna go with A. Well, and the other thing too, if we remember the audience of who's taking these tests, these are not technology you know, managers, right? So if you think that it's, if it's between two questions and one is really technical and you'd have to have some detailed technical knowledge, I don't believe that's the purpose of this exam for the type of individuals taking it. Now I'm about to sit for a security exam and so it gets real detailed. So um, the other thing is all of what Rick said, I totally agree with. So uh, most people said A, but several said D. And that's where I would just say, go for the more broader answer. Um, because I don't, I do not expect them to ask such detailed technical questions. And maybe Jen should have told us to add some, but <laughs> or somebody else on the line that's had been on the call. Okay. Next. All right, one of the major elements of an information system strategic plan includes the requests for proposals from vendors, specifications for computer program documentation, specifications for computer hardware maintenance or software development plan. And this sounds very similar to a question we just did, doesn't it? So um, it, uh, it means that I may be getting the same one or it may just have shown up in the sample ones. But again, we're looking at strategic plan. So strategic is gonna be big. An RFP, nope, that's gonna come later. Specifications for documentation, that's not very strategic. Uh, specifications for maintenance, no, not the maintenance, that's really tactical. So by process of elimination, I'm gonna get down to D, which could be the only one left and Development plan is gonna fit in with strategic plan? Yeah, probably. So even without knowing all this stuff, I can pretty much narrow it down to D and, and hope that's right. You absolutely are right on that. And I think that why you keep seeing requests for proposals from vendors and a lot of these questions is because many times vendors will come in and pitch a product, right? And that's how decision, sometimes 
decisions are being made about purchasing tools, but it should always start with a strategic plan and your software development plan. So you should never be making decisions based on a vendor pitch unless it was part of already complete, already decided in those higher level documents. Okay. Ken, so selection of an, here we go again, selection of an information system in a healthcare organization should begin with A, meeting with several information system vendors to determine the scope of availability of available technology. B, hiring an information systems consultant to determine the organization's strategic needs. C, development of an information systems plan that supports the organization's existing strategic objectives, or D, evaluation of available hardware and software to best determine what meets the organizational needs. So I'm gonna focus here on begin with, right? So again, all these things might occur, but what's gotta come first? A meeting with vendors definitely should not come first. Hiring a consultant, well, maybe, because that's, you know, given the complexity of everything, uh, it might be a consultant. Development of the plan. Yeah, I'm a planner, so I think the plan always should come first. And evaluation of the hardware and software. Now, I have to know what the needs are before I can do that evaluation. So I'm eliminating A and D immediately, and I'm going between B and C. Now, B might be a way of accomplishing C, but it's not the only way. So that's going to make C the, the broader one. So I have the slightest idea of what I'm talking about, I'm going to go with C. So just as another reminder here, a consultant, because I've been one for 25 years, <laughs> should never determine the organizational strategic needs. We can support the identification. We can, you know, help facilitate meetings, but it's always the executives that should be, or business owners that should be determining their needs. So that would eliminate B as a possible. It, and I went right over determine. I, I went right past that one. So That's yeah. why the questions slowly. Yeah. yeah R FQ, read the question. Yes. Okay, 11. A comprehensive information security policy should include all of the following elements except management policies, data backup and recovery, physical security, and technical controls. Hmm. Well, let's see. So information security policy it needs policies. Does it need management policies? Not sure. Data backup and recovery. That sounds like it's a way of getting our information secure by backing things up, but recovery sounds like we've already failed. I'm not sure on that. Uh, physical security, I guess, stop people from coming into your computer center who shouldn't be there. And technical controls. So I'm not sure. Is that things like passwords and stuff? I'm not really sure on that. So I'm looking at this one and again, limited knowledge in this area, I really cannot come up with a good answer. Um, I'm pretty sure I can eliminate A, but on the other hand, I'm not comfortable eliminating A and I don't know what D is enough to do it. So I'm lost. I would take a wild guess on this one. So let me see if I can help. Um, okay, please. In general, consultant. Yeah, in general, a policy is explains high level management intent. So if you can remember that about a policy, right? Which means it's not gonna get into the, how you do something, it's gonna be what we need to have for the organization, right? So you management policies would be important to have on you know the intent of what we're trying to achieve in, information security, you need to have data backup and recovery. The policy doesn't need to say how you're, you know, specifically you're going to do it and with what tools. You need to have in your policy that you're going to do physical security. 
technical controls are how you do something, right? So this one is, if you don't have any IT understanding at all, this can be a real trick question. Um, and I could see why Rick picked management policies. But if you can remember that a policy explains high level management intent, then you'll include that in, that would be a good thing to have in a policy. So the answer should be D. And, and another important point here is that there's a whole bunch of questions on this test and you are not gonna feel good about all of them. There's gonna be at least one or two where you are flipping a coin, you have no idea. And as long as there's only a few of them, you're in good shape, but don't beat yourself up when you run into a question and you say random choice, cause I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have one more. In an IT system development life cycle, which is the most important step? And I'm just gonna give one hint here. Remember what I said at the beginning, IT supports business objectives. That's their primary goal. So is it A, system analysis, B, system design, C, system acquisition, or D, system implementation? And when I look at this, I'm thinking, well, okay, design is an early part of the stage, but not the earliest necessarily. Acquisition certainly comes after design. And if you don't do the design right, acquisition's not gonna work. Um, implementation could cover all of it or it could be hitting the switch. But analysis seems like that's gotta be the starting point for this, because if you don't analyze your needs, you're going to redesign or you're going to design a system that doesn't meet those needs. So I'm going to go with A. An analysis is what you're trying to achieve, right? So you analyze what you have, what you don't have, what your goals are. So that's a very good choice, Rick. You need to do all of that before you start designing the system. So it meet, because remember, designing the system is to meet your needs. So you need to do that system analysis or needs analysis first. One of our participants brought up the life cycle. And I think that's an important part in this particular uh, topic is to just continually think about the life cycle in each of these um, questions and domains. Thank you. And I think I saw a question about the technical controls. If we could go back to 11. Somebody says, aren't technical controls important? So having technical security in place is important and it should be, um, it's absolutely part of what information security does for an organization, but the controls are very more specific, right? What tools you're gonna use. And remember it's the intent, management intent is the policy of what you know you want to have physical security you want to make sure you maintain patient privacy and you know all of that stuff so the technical controls are a level down um i, I hope that answers it a little better but it's it's more specifically how you're going to execute the policy not doesn't have to be part of the policy Okay. If, are well, there... Thank you so much, Angela. This was an incredible presentation and your expertise is much appreciated um, in this topic area. And uh, as you stay on, if people have more, individuals have more questions, we can get those to you as well. Or, uh, but thank you, we appreciate it. And Nora, take us through human resources. <laughs> All right, so um, checking our, you know, trying to keep track of time here. We're gonna blast through this section really, really fast. Be and and again, do um, there's fewer questions, so that's e examples. So that's gonna go really fast because we're either going to spend more time on this and not do our Quizlet demonstration. And I believe our Quizlet demonstration is so important. But so let me blast through, and um, please forgive me. Um, but it was so valuable. I know IT is my weakness, so it was so valuable to spend that amount of time on the IT piece. Um, so thank you, Angela. I got half of those answers wrong. So there it is. Um, okay. So for human resources, um, you know, I sent out the highlights ahead of time. 
so that you could be listening to Rick's presentation and focusing on what what we're talking about here. And early on, we were talking about you know this isn't this test isn't just rote memor uh, memorization. Unfortunately, for some of the rules and regs and in finance, those are really important. Anyway, so it is very very at the basic level, you need to know human resources laws and regulations. And again, this is a national, this test is national in scope. So forget what you know about California specific, you know, but, but wait, California has this. Yes, agreed. But remember from a national perspective, knowledge of recruitment and retention approaches and techniques, you know, uh, there are, it's all about now to demonstrate uh, compliance with recruitment and retention approaches. Knowledge of staffing methodologies and productivity management. Um, again, it, you know, we have to do this daily looking at, at staffing and productivity management. Knowledge of performance management systems, performance, uh, performance evals, reward systems, disciplinary policies and procedures. Knowledge of employee motivation and development techniques. Um, knowledge of employee satisfaction and engagement measurement and improvement techniques, knowledge of compensation and benefit practices. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the, Cal OSHA, knowledge of employee safety, security, and health issues. Oh my goodness, with the pandemic, that added a whole new level of everything. Um, knowledge of conflict resolution and grievance procedures knowledge of potential impacts and consequences of human resources decision-making on operations, finance, healthcare, quality of care. I mean, it's everything. Knowledge of selection techniques, commonly available assessments and relative benefits. That one, I'm really not quite sure what that means. I'll have to research that a little more. Knowledge of labor relations practices and strategies, um, knowledge of job design processes. That's a tough one, even for someone administrative like me. And knowledge of succession planning models. So again, this is broad highlights. Most of you know bits and pieces. Most of you will know more than you think you know, but let's go ahead and jump into the sample questions. Okay, and so... Um, So, Michael, you're doing the odd numbers, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay, I'll start the question for HR. Uh, question number one, uh, which of the following is typically performed during background check? It is A, or select A, ver verification of personal finances, B, involvement in religious or political activities, C, previous employment or education claims, or D, prior performance evaluation. So uh, the answer is very, uh, you know, uh, obvious. However, as one of the uh, advice is to go over, uh, go over all, to all the selections, I'm going to uh, uh, apply the selection, the elimination process here. Verification of personal finances. Uh, maybe some organizations and some states probably do, uh, do this, but we are at a federal level, as Nora mentioned. Uh, involvement in religious or, or political activities, definitely a no. That's a protected class. Previous employment or education claims, I would mark that as a yes. And D, prior performance evaluation, I would mark that as a no. And next slide for the answer is C, which is the previous employment or education claims. Rick, anything else to add on, on Michael's know. most nope. excellent nope. framework? <laughs> that was it. And again, the key to that is typically, right? Um, so again, like Michael said, there might be some specific industries that need a, a financial background check. Okay, next okay. question. So, two, so primary purpose, primary purpose, okay, and then performance appraisal system. So those are the two things I'm looking at. So comparing employees across the organization, well, no, there's some appraisal systems that do compare employees, but that's not the purpose of it, it's the technique. So that's no. Uh, provide em 
employees with developmental feedback and guidance. Yeah, that's something we try to do. Uh, ensure they understand the job they're supposed to be doing. Well, I hope we're doing that before we start appraising them. So that's no. Determine how well management engages employees, not in any system I've seen. So B is gonna be my answer. Most of our chat room people agree. That's because we have such a smart group of people in the room. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's for me. Uh, before I will read the question for number three, uh, question number one, just uh, some uh, knowledge base to remember for that is uh, you should be able to you know uh, have a knowledge on the uh, uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures at the federal level. So just want to give you a, you know, a term on that. So, and Thank number you. three, with growing frequency, employees um, who have been dismissed are resorting, uh, resorting to lawsuits for redress. In such cases, uh, the court may find in favor of the plaintiff if the employer dismissed the plaintiff A for cause with, but without using progressive discipline, without cause for B, C before the end of the plaintiff's probationary period, and D for union organizing activities. The same process from number one, the question, the answer is very obvious, but I'm gonna go through and do, uh, do my, you know, uh, brainstorming for myself if I, if I am asked, uh, you know, uh, answering this question for cause, but without progressive discipline, yes, it, it's it's okay. Uh, one of the reasons that you can, uh, you know, uh, fire or dismiss employee be without cause. The keyword is without cause there. So I would say yes to that. B, before the end of plaintiff's probationary period. So it's still legal to dismiss employee within the probationary period as long as there's a you know a reason. And D for union organizing activities, I think you cannot dismiss employees for this uh, because uh, this is the right to uh, to organize union. Um, and the answer is our next slide is B, and which is everyone answered I think B. Next question. Wait, I'm, I'm gonna, can we go back on that one? Because I'm confused on something. It said the, the court may find in favor of the plaintiff, that's the employee who's, who got fired. Yeah. And if you get fired for union organizing activities, wouldn't the court find in your favor since that's illegal? It is, uh, you're right, right? I, but, th I think both B and D are correct on this one. Yeah, you're right. That's going to be confusing. So uh, yeah, good point. I will See, put fresh, this in the fresh parking eyes on these. lot. Um, we do yeah. that if there's a question. Um, and you know, I, as I look at this, I've taught this section is the more correct answer for uh, is um, without cause. So, but uh, we'll look up union activities uh, as well, so it could be confusing. Could the, could the keyword be growing frequency, that being a more popular trend for the last question? Good That's point. a good question, maybe, because being fired for union activity is very specific. And I think uh, we might ask Amazon what's going on with them, but uh, uh, I don't know if it's a trend, whereas being fired without cause, regardless of whether it's a union or uh, not, yeah, or not, and regardless of whether you're in a a right to work state, any of those things, that would probably be the trend. So that might be it. That's why it's the B, right? That, yeah, that's why it'd be, but it still seems pretty subtle to me. I like what uh, the conversation in our chat, it's excellent. You guys are really thinking um, is that uh, uh, without cause equals redress or unfair where, uh, and again, not all states are unionized. Um, and so as we've said, the, the global uh, picture across the uh, uh, our nation is really where we'll be looking for answers because this is a, a, a national test. So great conversations there in the uh, chat. Thank you. Okay, which of the following would be considered the most effective, <laughs> most effective to prevent the need for employee discipline? So I'm looking for things that mean we don't have to discipline people. Okay, and some because there's a lot of words in that one to 
think which one goes where. So having accurate job descriptions, well, yeah, people know what they're doing, that helps, that's a good thing, but is it the most effective? Having an employee orientation, yeah, again, well, it's gonna help, but may not be the most effective. Implementing performance-based compensation, I don't see what that has to do with discipline. Giving managers a small span of control. Hmm. I don't know. That one doesn't seem like it would relate. So I'm going to go between A and B here. And which one is going to be most effective? I think most effective would be making sure they really know what they're responsible for. So orientation is a good thing, but I don't think it's as effective as having a good job description. So I'm going to go with A. Good job. Okay, so on that note, um, we have, we actually have four more questions, but we're running out of time. Um, and we really want to do the Quizlet um, presentation because it's so valuable. So what I will ask, and I need to clarify before we sign off on what to expect when I send out the communications, but if, when I send out this, this presentation, Go ahead and answer the next four. And if you have any questions, send those to me early and I will use them in our update FAQ thing to follow up if anybody's confused about that. Okay, so apologize for needing to cut this one short. But um, again, there will be a way to address your concerns if you have any questions about, about the answers. Okay, and on that note, um, you know, we could be here till two in the afternoon if I let this keep going, I promise. And and still everybody would be very interested. So at this point, Michael, do you mind uh, sharing your screen? We'll take off uh, this presentation and do your screen and do Quizlet. Can you please stop sharing first, uh, Sasha? And Nora, while they're doing that, uh, each of the participants will get this PowerPoint too, and that will have the um, each of the uh, sample questions we're doing. So you'll have a right. chance to go through them. So thank you. So can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So well, at least I can. <laughs> so this is the Quizlet. So when you buy the flashcard, you have the uh, ability to uh, access the Quizlet uh, electronically, you know, for a year, I guess, right, Nora? Yeah, 12 months. Okay. From so, activation. Uh, yeah, this is the homepage of the Quizlet and you can just go to the uh, folder uh, to see all the, uh, you know, the uh, body of knowledge, the 10 body of knowledge for this exam. So I would like to show you today the, uh, the uh, finance first. No, IT, um, oh, I'm, number I'm, five. Yes, number, number five. five. IT, I'm sorry, so. So for, uh, for the Quizlet, you, you, depending on your uh, uh, learning, uh, habits or the way you learn, you can use the flashcards or, uh, or, or writing it or spelling the, the uh, spelling the uh, spell the uh, right answer or through test uh, test with various uh, um, modes like matching types, multiple choice or true or false. So let's go back to the flashcard and we'll just try one or two of the uh, of the questions. Uh, the, you can use the flashcard either first reading the uh, the uh, terms and after that the, uh, the definition. So for this, it's uh, you know it's it's shown as the uh, it shows the uh, terms first before the definition. So adjustment, and if you just click that one, it will tell you the uh, it will show you the definition of the adjustment. It's just uh, so uh, this this is this is the definition of the adjustment. So then, if you uh, like to uh, you know look at the other questions or terms, just keep on moving forward. Then just press or click that; it will show you the uh, the definition of the term. So, so that is the flashcard. So uh, let's go to the test, and we'll, we'll answer some we, we will answer some questions. Uh, so a uh, really quick key to the test. Every time you hit test, it generates a new test. So you can copy, you can um, save them, print them out. Um, so, I mean, that's the beauty of this thing. Um, and again, all these different ways that you can 
um, present the questions. It, it's all useful. So can't I can't sing the praises enough of this okay. functionality. Okay. Okay. So the let's select the option multiple choice and true or false. How's that? Is that a good good uh, for everyone? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm speaking out of turn. <laughs> okay, then create a new test. So let's uh, uh, answer the number uh, uh, no, question number one for multiple choice. Uh, legislation that promotes the adoption and meaningful use of health information technology, part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, and usually referred to as the High Tech Act. A high tech and clinical act, clinical health act, B, healthcare information exchange, C, M health application, and D, health information. So if you can just put your answer in the chat and I will mark the best answer from the, cha from the chat. I cannot see the chat right now, where is it? I see A coming up as the. Okay, A. Yeah. Okay, I'll put A. Then two is a web accessible library of work processes, protocols, and performance measures available to all staff. A, data warehouse, B, grid computing, C, cloud computing, or D, meaningful use. What can you say there, uh, Nora? Uh, people are saying A. Okay. A. Let's choose A. Number let's, three. Let's do one more. Uh -huh. Number three, a standard or data formatting that helps to facilitate the exchange of data among disparate systems within and across software vendors. A, health informatics, B, healthcare information exchange, C, health level seven or HL7, and D, M, health application. I wouldn't know the answer to this, but most people are saying C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, that's what I think also. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, we need to stop there. We're running out of time, but. Um... Let's do a two false, just just because this is how the brain walk really works well. Okay, true false. True. Number one, remote access to data storage and processing functions via the internet without use of concern or concern for the physical location in which the actual processing or storage systems are housed is called grid computing. That's a mouthful. <laughs> is that true or false? I'm seeing, oh, I'm seeing between fault, true, a couple of falses and a true coming across. So let's, let's put false. Okay. So one more for this. Yeah. A system that provides for the organized storage processing and retrieval of information to support patient care activities is called decision support system. Is that true or false? Uh, trues, we're getting some trues. Okay. Okay, true. Yeah, okay. okay. So let's check the answers. Let's go up. So for number one, for more multiple choice, we uh, answered health information technology for economic and clinical health act. We were wrong. The correct answer is the small letter M health application. Number two is data warehouse. We're correct with that. And number three, health level seven or the HL seven is the correct answer for that, for number three. And for the true and false, let's go down. Correct, false. The correct, the correct answer is false. And we answered false, that's correct, right? And the number two, incorrect, the true answer is, the correct answer is false. 
decision because the right clinic Sorry. because of the clinical information it should be clinical information system instead of decision support system angela is gonna help us with that one <laughs> read, read the words um it says to support patient care activities mm -hmm. right so yes the the other information in the in the question was right, but for patient care activities, that would not be decision support. Um, and then the other question on the act, um, what's the name for an act? It wouldn't be another act. So that would just kind of that was a, those are tough questions actually for so just kind of read through those a little more carefully. That's the only advice I can give. Don't go so fast. And I know we're going fast, so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's go to the HR one really quick. And okay. there is a question about how often are the flashcards updated? And the exam, okay, uh, really quick. The exam is updated a quarter of it every year. So in four years, it's uh, completely different. The beauty of this electronic version here, this is updated like, as the test is updated. So this will be the most current version of anything you'll see. So, um, okay, so let's go straight to the test because it's the same. Let's just do one test with uh, true, uh, multiple choice. Let's just do multiple choice. So multiple choice human resources. Number one, the theory that employees in an organization will be promoted to their highest level of competence and then be promoted to and remain at a level at which they are incompetent. A, Family and Medical Leave Act, B, Equity Theory, C, Impaired Practitioner, D, Peter Principle. I haven't heard that one in a while. Oh, that is funny. You mean the Peter Principle? Yeah, I yeah, I hadn't heard that phrase in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting uh, we're getting C's and D's. We got a D. We got D's. More okay. D. Yeah. Two. The set of rewards that organizations provide to staff in exchange for their performance of various organizational tasks and jobs. A. Criterion deficiency. B. Training development. D, C, comp compensation strategy, and D, performance standards. Getting some Ds. Hmm. I'm getting some Cs. Yeah. C, C, yeah. C, C, D. Okay, so what? what's the uh, highest? Uh, D or C? Uh, let's go with C. Okay. Okay, we got to go. Okay. You want me to uh, check the answers? Sure. Oh. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Sorry, we're blasting through this, everyone. Okay. What's the multiple choice there? One, Peter Principle is correct, and compensation strategy is correct. Yeah, and I think the, the key there is a performance system is addressed in the question and the performance was in the answers, but the key is, okay, we've already talked about the performance stuff. Now what's the reward? So the compensation works there. Okay. Um, all right. So on that note, I'm going to close off HR uh, again, apologize for blasting through, but, it, it, but again, IT was so valuable too. Um, again, you're going to be getting a copy. So let's be clear on what I'm gonna be sending out. For this session follow-up, you're gonna be getting a copy, you're gonna get the link to the recording that's gonna be on our YouTube channel. You're gonna get this presentation that we just sent, I mean, that we just presented. You're gonna get additional sample questions that we have in our repository, as well as a PowerPoint presentation since we're not able to send a, a copy of the actual PowerPoint that was in the pre-recorded session, you're gonna get a, the 2019 Cal presentations on both of these topics. Okay, so that's the follow-up. For the session 
three, there's been some confusion about whether I'm sending a link to the actual session. When I'm sending in the session three materials will be links to the presentations, the pre-recorded presentations that uh, Rick has put together, okay? Not to our actual session. You'll also be getting the uh, highlights, again, straight from ACHE, straight off of what they consider to be the highlights for those topics. And that's, and that's what you'll be getting in the session three pre-work. Let's call it pre-work. There you go. That's what I'll call that. So that you have a chance to listen to the presentations before we do the session. Because again, you see, you know, we're spending so much time on the sample questions because they're so important to understand how to read them and how to interpret them and, and the keywords to look for. Thank you, Nora. I so think when you identified it as uh, the prep sessions, the prep email, and then the post or follow-up email, that uh, uh, is helpful. Uh, and then I know we had a couple questions in our chat. Where can we find the YouTube channel? It'll be on the link that we send out. And I, we also had another comment, which we appreciate is uh, just emphasizing the value of the Quizlet. Um, and yeah. again, I think we shared last week uh, how to get Quizlet, but if you don't mind, again, just reminding folks how to get the Quizlet um, package. So it's part of the study bundle. You can get it individually or part of the study bundle in the ACHE um, education sorry, uh, site. It, it'll have a link there. Our, and because I haven't sent out session one follow-up yet, the links are also there on, on our general overview. So we'll ask uh, everyone to look uh, yeah. for the session one follow-up. That ahead, will be sorry. coming. I'm thinking tomorrow I'll be okay. sending that out. Nora, I put the uh, link in the chat earlier, but it's probably way up there by now. But also right. it's on, if you go to the Cal website and go to the fellowship advancement, it's in the, oh, that's uh, it's in the FAQ as well. And then just as a, um, a general announcement is, um, the Zoom link is the same each week, so uh, we apologize yes. if there's any confusion, but you'll use the same Zoom link. It came out through uh, Eventbrite. Some of you um, were able to get it this morning, um, and that's the same one for all five sessions. So thank you, Sasha, and all that we're sending those out to folks as a reminder. And again, uh, I'm sorry, there were a bunch of emails that came across um, and I'll be working on responding to any of those that we haven't responded to yet. But again, send, send me questions, uh, you know, we'll research and put them on our FAQs, updates and FAQs um, for next week. And again, thank you so much for participating. Again, I'm always in awe of the participants in these sessions. And this is truly an honor on our part to be able to present this to you. And to have people like Angela, I mean, thank you so much, Angela. I learned more about IT today than I have for a while. And that's with me doing the PowerPoints. I mean, I know this, I've, I read it, but I don't understand it. So thank you very much. And in our commitment to get you out by 11.30 so you can enjoy some of your weekend, we are a thank you again and uh, have you sign out and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you all.